For nearly two centuries, these hills overlooking the Connecticut River at Springfield, Massachusetts, have been the home of the famed Springfield Armory. The arsenal was deactivated by the Department of Defense in April 1968. During its long and colorful life, the Springfield Armory turned out more than nine million firearms of every purpose and description. Since 1795, American soldiers have been armed with guns from the Springfield Armory. Today, Federal Square, as the area is known, is still the site of armaments development and manufacture. Many of the buildings have been taken over by a large government contractor, and the production of some of this nation's latest weapons takes place here. Some of the buildings of this National Historical Landmark have been given over to the Springfield Technical Community College. The former headquarters of this military post now house the dean's office and the various administrative offices. Flanking both sides of the parade ground are the old officers' quarters, which now serve as study halls for the various technical subjects taught here. Well, the ground on which I am walking is rich in the history of our country. General George Washington founded this great arsenal in 1777 and later visited it during the time he was president. Well, Franklin D. Roosevelt was another of our presidents who came here. The list of famous military leaders who trod this green is endless. The beloved poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, after a visit, composed a special poem about the arsenal. That building was the main arsenal. In 1871, the commanding officer, Colonel J.G. Benton, officially created an ordnance museum, and today it occupies all of the building. It is called the Springfield Armory Museum. and contains more than 11,000 firearms and other weapons gathered from every corner of the globe. It is one of the largest collections of military arms in the world. Thanks to Colonel Benton, who lived in that imposing home over there, we will be able to see some of the guns which played such a vital role in the history of our country. Like the thousands who come here to find out about the development of our military weapons over the years, let us too see the guns at Springfield. At the outset of the Revolutionary War in 1776, the colonial patriots had very few firearms. There were only a handful of gunsmiths throughout all of New England, and work as they might, they couldn't possibly make enough weapons to arm the Continental Army against the British. But, as we all know from our history books, the colonists did get armed. Some of them were captured from the British, others came from various foreign nations, all were crude flintlock weapons, like this early French pistol. The story of firearms development in America is a fascinating saga of our Army's history. One of the nation's foremost authorities on this subject is with us today. I'd like to introduce him to you. Tom Wall, director of the Springfield Armory Museum. Hello, Tom. I'm delighted you could be with us to help explain some of the interesting background on the guns here at the Armour Museum. Well, I'm not sure you needed me today, Russell. From what I've seen, you're really up on the history of small arms. For instance, you were talking about all of those imported European weapons that our forefathers used. I have one here. This is the French Charlieville flintlock musket. Thousands of these were imported into the colonies from France between 1776 and 1781. Certainly seems well made, even after all these years. Did our soldiers like these guns? Yes, these are the finest military weapons of the period. The hammer had a piece of flint clamped in it, and the spark to ignite the gunpowder was created when the flint struck an iron plate. To load, the soldier had to ram a powder and ball charge down into the barrel from the muzzle end of the musket. 
He had a ramrod, which was carried in the gun stock for that purpose. Then, a priming charge of powder was poured into the pan alongside the chamber. When this primer was ignited by the flint spark, it entered a small touch hole and set off the main charge. What did the Springfield Armory have to do about all this? During the Revolutionary War, I mean. Well, the Continental Army stored firearms and powder here. However, the main purpose of the Army during this period was the manufacture of this paper cartridge, which was used in the Army musket. It wasn't until April of 1794 that Congress enacted legislation that established the Springfield Armory and directed that weapons be manufactured and stored here. When did they make the first gun here at Springfield? It was a flintlock musket in 1795. Come over here and I'll show you. Russ, this is the first official U.S. Army weapon patterned after the French Charleville musket that we were just looking at. We copied the French design because of its obvious superiority in the Revolutionary War. This is the 1795 Springfield flintlock musket. It weighed about nine pounds and was a product of good craftsmanship. Our troops used these muskets, along with some of the foreign guns still in service during the War of 1812 against the British and Canadians, and at the Battle of Tippecanoe against the Shawnee Indians. Well, then this is the first U.S. arsenal-made weapon the Army used. Is that right? Yes. The gunsmiths in this country had been making muskets for a number of years, but they were for private individuals and various colonial governments. I see. What was the next gun that was made here? Well, we had some variations in the flintlock design, but in 1842, the big change was the addition of the percussion musket. Then we added some rifling to the weapon, and this increased the accuracy and gave us a better range. By 1861, we had the best military shoulder weapon of the day. We've got quite a collection of them over here. Incidentally, it was the display of this type which inspired Henry Wadsworth Longfellow to write the poem, The Arsenal at Springfield. Before the Civil War, he brought his bride here for a visit, and she remarked that these stands of guns reminded her of a great pipe organ. I guess he was pretty impressed because there were some 50,000 muskets stored here at the time, and the hall was filled with racks like this one. If you've never read the poem, here's the first stanza. This is the arsenal. From floor to ceiling, like a huge organ, rise the burnished arms. But from their silent pipes, no anthem pealing startles the villages with strange alarms. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 1843. These are the standard model 1861-63 Springfield rifle musket. Both sides used these during the Civil War. Thousands of these were captured by the Confederates from the Union forces at the early stages of the Civil War. What makes these guns so special? Two things, Russell. First, the firing time was speeded up, and the gun was made more dependable because of this percussion system. The hammer struck this copper cap That, in turn, ignited the charge in the barrel. Second, the mini ball, which is more accurate than the musket ball, loaded more rapidly. Despite the fact that these rifle muskets still had to be loaded from the muzzle end of the gun, they were a great improvement over the old flintlocks. Eighty percent of all the casualties in the Civil War were caused by this weapon. The 10th Massachusetts Battalion of Artillery from Worcester, the 1st Connecticut Volunteer Infantry from South Windsor, and the 14th Connecticut Volunteer Infantry from Glastonbury put on a demonstration of these old weapons. Load! Fire! 
Ready, fire! Fire! important thing about these guns is the fact that they were the first mass-produced firearms and had the advantage of interchangeable parts. I guess the mass production scheme changed things quite a bit here at the armory, didn't it, Tom? It sure did. Muskets had been limited in production up to the Civil War. The piecework idea for each army employee made one specific part or performed a single function in the manufacturing process enabled the Armory to put out over a thousand muskets a day by 1864. Some 3,000 employees were used on the production lines. After the Civil War, the U.S. Cavalry had a rough time with the Indians of the Western Plains, Tom. What was the gun they used to fight the Indians? Was it the same one we just seen? No. By 1873, the Springfield Armory was turning out a new breech-loading gun designed by the master armor, Erskine Allen. Officially, the government called it the U.S. Carbine Model 1873. But to the technicians here and the soldiers who used them, the guns were known as the Trapdoor Springfield. With the increased rate of fire and the long range of this weapon, our troops easily gained superiority over the Indians. This was a major factor in opening the western frontier. Speaking of the cavalry, Russell, here's a famous revolver which was issued to all cavalry officers in those days. Ah, uh, yes. 45 caliber Colt Peacemaker. Now, this was one of the great handguns of all time, wasn't it? Yes, it was. You know, old Sam Colt really designed himself a winner when he put out the six-shooter. It came in different barrel lengths, and a revolving cylinder bringing each cartridge under the hammer was practically foolproof. As a standard sidearm issued by the Army, it had no peer. Well, it's been almost a hundred years since this gun first appeared. Today's revolvers still work on the same principle. Yeah, that's what I call a good gun design. Well, Russell, the Army has always been interested in good gun design. Come over here and I'll show you an interesting example. In the 1880s, two Norwegians developed this bolt-action magazine rifle. This was a great improvement over the trapdoor system. As you can see, the rifle had to be loaded one cartridge at a time. On the other hand, this Norwegian design permitted the loading of several cartridges at one time. And to fire each one, all the soldier had to do was to work this bolt. It ejected the spent cartridge and placed a fresh load into the chamber in one easy motion. In 1892, the Army was impressed with this design and paid the two Norwegian inventors a royalty of one dollar per gun to have the Springfield Armory produce the weapon for standard U.S. Army issue. 